I'm gonna like jump to the conclusion of my talk briefly and say the goal is to have better return on attention. And so when we're talking about things like governance minimization, or we're talking about things like including, including AI in the loop within a DAO context, um, the goal of, of this, at least from my perspective, is to improve the uh, input-output relationship between the time, attention, and energy of members and positive externalities or outputs that uh, those members and people uh, beyond even those members value. And so um, we're actually going to work our way to that quickly um, from this concept of algorithms as policy. And um, I'm going to uh, start with this Drake meme. Everybody loves the Drake meme. Um, uh, so I'm not a huge fan of the phrase code is law. I actually think it's been like a gross uh, abuse of a concept that was introduced by Lawrence Lessig and that um, sort of didn't mean the thing that it gets used to mean that like code should be sort of immutable or treated like absolute in the sense that, um, you know, it can't be changed, but, but rather that we should still reasonably expect it not to be changed and certainly not to be changed without the sort of input of the people who are affected by those changes. And so I prefer this phrase algorithms as policy, which just like reminds us that we're making the algorithms to sort of govern our own behavior and then we're acting within those algorithms, we're abiding by their rules and that we actually do um, change them uh, when we need to. Um, we put parameters in our smart contracts, we deploy new smart contracts, we uh, establish various different kinds of um, uh, more normative rules, what's appropriate behavior within our communities. And so my super simple, a uh, sort of depiction of of a of a generic DAO is that we've got members, we've got smart contracts. There's also like lots of other stuff, pro policies, practices, procedures, whatever. But let's just say we've got our our roles embodied in smart contracts and members interacting with them for simplicity, and that um, there's the rest of the world. And so what ends up happening is that we bring in resources from the rest of the world, and that's including things that are. Uh, in like from us as members, right? We have other opportunities to do things. Our attention is valuable, maybe expertise, maybe um, we're making trade-offs against just like hanging out with our families or our friends. But at the end of the day, we're importing resources and we're using them together to do a thing and we're gonna produce some output. And maybe that output is something like return on investment if we're bringing in money and we're in a you know venture DAO and we're trying to produce returns. But rather than having that as a de facto assumption, we say, look, we get some externalities, some, um, some outputs. And so in some cases, that's open source software. In some cases, that's shared infrastructures like Web3 protocols that are operated and maintained by, by, by DAO communities. But at the end of the day, there's just some inputs and some outputs. And the real challenge that we run into time and time again is that it's never quite this simple. Like if you use a, a corporate model of the world, you just sort of have one actor, one centralized point of agency at the entity level here on the left. But in uh, in our DAO world, it's kind of a dumpster fire. Like we never agree on what we want to do, or if we do, it's because we're a really small group of people. The moment there's a larger group, you have some people who care about like you know, the return on the token, some people who care about the software, some people who care a little bit about both, some who are just hanging out with their friends and they want to do the projects that their friends want to do. You get the idea. It's a mess. It doesn't have to be a bad mess. In fact, my opinion is that this is a happy dumpster fire precisely because that conflict creates energy and that energy feeds like actual doing. And so if there was nothing to talk about or argue about, you wouldn't necessarily bring the attention in, you wouldn't have engagement and that engagement just needs to be channeled into productive work, which sort of brings us back to this idea of policy making. Is that it's not good enough just to have rules. You need to have have rules that drive outcomes. And so what we're actually doing when we're deciding what policies and procedures to put into our smart contracts or our Git contribution flows for that matter, like I include things like who has the right to push code, you know, what kind of pull request reviews are required, who has the right to do those pull request reviews. Those are policies in the same way. They're just rules that we make in order to channel our efforts into collective productive output. So um, at the end of the day, though, we have individual level behavior because we have a lot of um, sort of 
individual autonomy within these systems and we want that individual um, autonomy to roll up to like a meaningful collective autonomy meaning the entity is a cap capable of accomplishing higher higher level goals and uh, generally this middle box is something we would think of as policy making we're observing system level behavior we're possibly tweaking rules or appropriating funding like assigning funding to specific tasks which in turn incentivizes or or guides individual behavior which again drives outcomes so you get this feedback loop and so for a DAO, that's going to look a little bit more like this and again not super um super detailed uh you could argue that um this is already quite complex but if you're interested in like how uh fractal like sort of decentralized organizations could work i would recommend looking at things like a viable systems model or like a you know, a, a more general model of uh, uh, behavior in, in potentially large uh, organizations. But for our case, we just have our members. They act within the context of the rules provided by their smart contracts or the contributor guidelines of their Git repos or both. And um, that is the general interface to the outside world. So if you're working on smart contracts, if you have tokens, maybe those tokens are interacting with other smart contracts, or even if you have a protocol, then maybe some tokens are actually moving through it. So you have a smart contract to smart contract uh, interface. You have your contracts affecting people who aren't members. You have um, members interacting with other people who aren't members. And basically, a bunch of interfaces to the outside world through which these um, resources come in and through which externalities or outputs flow out. And maybe we can't always put like a nice clean utility function on that, but at the end of the day, we can think about resources in and, um, and, po and positive or potentially negative externalities out. Um, and when it comes to trying to drive efficiency in terms of resources in and positive external externalities out, you need some mechanism for adaptation. Like that's the first rule of any sort of ev evolutionary system is that it needs to be able to um, adapt to its circumstances to, to, to learn and evolve. Um, we don't want systems that evolve super fast. That makes them, um, that makes them uh, sensitive to capture, that makes them sensitive to other types of downsides. And so, you know, the way that we have dealt with this, at least in my research, is to construct this constitutional archetype, which basically says, look, things aren't completely immutable. We do change them, but the way in which they're changed is tightly constrained. So we use things like smart contracts for governance precisely because they um, shrink the set of things, the surface over which you can um, modify the way things work. And so we keep that small, but we don't make it zero. And then we're very intentional about sort of who can use it, how they use it, and which stakeholder groups are empowered. And if you're interested in this concept, it's in a paper that I wrote with uh, Kelsey Nabin. Um, if we come back to the um, sort of first uh, sort of little cartoon drawing, then we can just draw out this idea that we've got resources coming in, and I really want to focus on members' attention as an important concept and then these externalities out. And I like to focus on things like open source software or other um, permissionless uh, artifacts that are available for everyone. So it can be sometimes tricky if it's a not financial externality, um, because sometimes you do need to bring financial resources in to get it done. But in, in most DAOs, my experience has been the most valuable resources actually the attention of the members, especially those with expertise and the capability to, to build, operate, and maintain things, and that we really only find ourselves needing funding in order to, to supply them with the resources they need in order to commit the time, energy, and effort required to get the work done. So in a way, it's actually the funding which is, a, 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 is um, overemphasized, because if you can get the attention, time, and effort without the funding, then you can still get cool shit done but then you have to be worried about the externalities, potentially negative externalities that you push on those team members when they're giving up their time and effort and energy they could be using to say, um, you know, 
cover their expenses or, or other aspects of their life. So um, one of my big takeaways from the last several years in the DAO space is that some of the coolest shit that's happened happened because some people's financial constraints were un unburdened, that they had pretty great returns on what is effectively ETH and a few other things, ended up not capital constrained. They got to assign their time, attention, and energy to things they really cared about with other people who also really cared about it. And sort of irrespective of the um, direct funding of that work, the fact that they could steer that energy and produce great positive externalities for everyone else. So um, that's um, a heuristic that I use then. So I think that's about it for the talk. Um, the last slide is a thank you. I wanted to have a discussion about return on attention, and I thought we could sort of bring that back to the discussion about um, AI, where um, you know there are places where AI could really um, improve the our capacity to turn attention into outputs. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I remember the, the Dakota's law thing with Lessig, and yeah, that's an interesting point. Uh, up front, you know, that's kind of been uh, maybe taken the wrong way, that it, it it's not necessarily, maybe this meme isn't what you think it means. But um, yeah, so the way that it, the what you were talking about actually reminds me a lot of how UI talks about things uh, with systems designs and things like that. Did you have any uh, things UI you were thinking about during that? So rule-bound actions doesn't necessarily mean that they're rules that are legalistic as opposed to enshrined in software. So the moment that you introduce a smart contract, you've created a set of actions that are available through that mechanism. Um, and unlike the regular world, um, it's defined explicitly. Like there's a lot of implicit actions available to you in regular world space, in sort of software world space, um, the only actions available are, um, you know, declared. It's like a, it's a declarative action space. Yeah, that kind of gets, made me think about, like we were hearing from the HATS team later on these kind of uh, role-based permissions. And the other day we heard about um, the roles modifier on those safes, um, which, so there may be like a delegated team by the DAO that really they can only do one smart contract action. And maybe it's like you can perform a swap after this date if this KPI was met or something. Or um, you can like, uh, you can control and you can post some Twitter posts this day, but not that other day. I don't know. It's the things where the code, like Twitter's not a great example obviously because uh, we don't really have ways to control that on chain, but um, yeah, you rein in what a delegated team could do based on that role, and it may be something very specific around a uh, smart contract that's immutable, and and the, the like the the greater DAO is kind of agreed on. Is that kind of like what you're talking about? Thanks. I do think that's important, but it's not necessarily the point I'm making, because even in the case where there's no differentiated permissions, there's still explicit or, or sort of declarative action. So something as simple as an ERC-20 has a very clearly bounded set of actions that you can take to mutate the state of that. For example, you can send tokens that you control, but that action space is rule bound such that the total supply doesn't change when you transfer them. So when I, I talk about rule bound, I'm really just articulating that when you're designing smart contract methods, if you think of them a bit like a, a database with a very strict API for how you can change the database, that you you're, you should be very careful about like how things change, not just who changes them. But I do agree that it's, it's also very important to build um, uh, models that define access control, like who can do what, but there's a really important element of what can happen. Um, and this is embodied in things like, even just like Uniswap, right? You've got these constant function market makers there. Um, their sets of actions have very specific rules, and those rules actually undergird important properties. Reminds me of, um, who was it, Isaac doing DAO audits and the the apparent um, governance surface 
or like what's presented often being different from what is actually available through the smart contract. He mentioned nouns where on their front page it says one noun every day forever but then more accurately it should have an asterisk that says unless we call this function that changes that <laughs> you know like it does it's not set at one noun every day forever if the people who own nouns vote it could be one noun every hour forever and then they would have to update the the front it's funny because from a legibility standpoint, I don't think it's wrong to say one noun every day forever, but your point about an asterisk is something that I feel like it's only necessary because we have the implicit assumption that it can't change. And we've sort of crafted that. That was why I start with the reference to code as law. Like we built within like a culture, this sort of expectation, like normatively, that these contracts never change. But in practice, they often have parameters. In practice, people deploy V2 and deprecate V1. Like these kinds of things are, they're normal. Like we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't need to, um, we shouldn't need to say like, if I call them out with an asterisk, it should be generally expected that people within a system have some governance over it. But in order to do that well, we have to first acknowledge that it's a thing and then be careful about it because those same mechanisms are the attack vectors. And so you end up with this double-edged sword. You need uh, a governance surface, a set of parameters or a set of rules through which um, changes are made or new contracts are deployed in order to keep something fresh and warm and relevant in the world and useful for the people who are participating and consuming the outputs. But you also, again, you don't want those things to be invisible and you don't want, you want it to be clear how, how that system works. And, you know, ideally it should be pretty conservative meaning that making changes is, is somewhat hard um, as, in order to avoid easy capture. And like I said earlier, like I've been doing quite a bit of research on this with um, Kelsey Nabin and some folks at Block Science as well as folks at Metagov, and that, that it's about recognizing that there isn't like one final right answer and that you're tuning this space depending on what your DAO is and, and what you're governing and what the risk factors are. And so the principles to keep in mind are things like okay, how can this be changed? By whom? Is it transparent to everyone how that works? And um, with respect to the return on attention, I highlight that because there tends to be a swing way in the other direction. That suddenly there's all of these governance parameters and all of this attention debating you know, parameters and changes and new versions, and that's not good either, right? That's a, a, a potentially a big waste of time and effort and energy. So like finding a way to strike the balance, for me, comes down to what are the outputs of the DAO? What are the inputs of the DAO, including the time, attention, and energy of its members? And then how do we turn like the, the time, attention, and energy into max positive externalities for, for, but again, both for the members themselves as well as other people consuming those outputs? So looking at it like a, a machine, basically, with inputs and outputs, it kind of doesn't matter exactly what happens inside so long as the externalities are being optimized so so, so so i don't necessarily like the characterization of that as mechanistic because it's actually a really good description of ecologies ecologies tend to be big heterogeneous systems made up of subsystems whose inputs and outputs are matched effectively so like you grab an atom or like an element or a stakeholder group or a DAO, and you look at what it imports and what it exports and you view it as just like a, a sort of organic subsystem that's plugged into an emergent ecology of a bunch of other things with inputs and outputs. And success looks like a, a biodiverse ecosystem with lots of different things, some of which are maybe optimized to you know, produce capital, whereas others are optimized to produce different types of open source software, whereas others are optimized to provide operational support services. Like I'm a fan of this new org, uh, not that new, but like Thing3 is working with Hydra to help get things up and running. Like that's important, right? These are little, you know, things that need to be exported. And it's actually really helpful to have the time, attention and energy of people who are specialized in doing that kind of work. Um, made available and so you end up with a much more like healthy DAO ecosystem if you have these diverse biological 
and you can call it a machine if you want because I'm reasoning about it in terms of inputs and outputs, but I, I don't think that the machine characterization is actually that helpful. I think these are pretty organic things. Yeah, well, it reminds me of the Thinking in Systems book. Of, I'm assuming, have you seen that one? Where Mid Meadows, yeah. They kind of take complex systems and boil them down into what are the inputs and the outputs, and it can help you understand complex systems so I kind of see you doing that you know when I say machine it's sort of like you can draw a chart you know yes it's complex human with depth and complex interactions between between all of them but at the same time you can draw a circle around regions of it and define the inputs and outputs and simplify it in a way that's helpful that's right I think the key is that drawing lines, dotted lines around systems is a subjective act. And so you draw the dotted line region, then you reason about flows over, like you know, basically over the boundary and you reason about the flows inside. So I know we're just at time. So I want to leave like just off on a heuristic that I've found really powerful for doing this kind of thing. It's like for whatever system that you care about, you're going to like think about one system above it and one below it. What that means is your thing, let's say your DAO, it's a member of an ecosystem, something above. So as a part within a whole, you can say, you know, again, what are my inflows and what are my outflows and who, am, who, where are my inflows coming from? Where are my outflows going to? And what is the health of that system one level above me look like? And the other is to do, drill down in and ask like, what is the system, the subsystems that my system is made up of? What are the things that we need to do to keep working, to be effective, to be healthy ourselves? And so that like abstraction sandwich leaves you with a pretty well bounded sense of what success looks like. You can, you can try to be a good whole made up of your parts and a good part within a greater whole. And if your system makes sense from those two perspectives, there's a good chance that you'll have something like viable and sustainable.